All right, there we go. All righty, people. Woo. I might have to call everybody down like I did in my classroom. Uh, I just I should have brought my gavel with me. Or my air horn. Yeah, there you go. I ain't the judge. There's only one judge, and that's... Yep. All right, so let's get back to it. So... Again, continuing on, looking at the beliefs of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And, you know, we looked at several things a while ago, but now we're going to get into a lot more of the doctrine and theology. We're going to get into the doctrine and theology of the Jehovah's Witnesses and, again, what they, again, their actual teachings and such. So, again, we looked more at the structural organization and everything, the books and stuff that they used. Uh, a while ago, but again, now we're getting to the actual teachings that they actually have. And again, it is important for us to know these things. Again, that way we know what to expect when we start dealing with them. So the first thing we need to look at is, of course, their view about God. Their view about God. To them, Jehovah is God and no one else. So only Jehovah is God, no one else is God. And I can agree with that. There's only one God, and his name is Jehovah. Only Jehovah should be worshipped and obeyed as absolute ruler. So Jehovah is the only one that should be worshipped and obeyed. He is the only one that is the absolute ruler of all things. I can get down with that as well. And they are to sanctify God's name by word and deed. That is their primary focus. The Jehovah's Witness' primary focus, again, is to sanctify God's name in word and deed. So all the things they say, all the things they do, they're supposed to be trying to sanctify the name of Jehovah above all else. So the, key, the real interesting thing, though, is, as with a lot of cults, they actually deny the Trinity. They do not believe in the Trinity. So they end up rejecting the Trinity doctrine. Of course, we know the Trinity doctrine, right? You know, they have one God, but three persons, right? You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. But God the Father is not God the Son or the Holy Spirit. God the Son is not God the Father or the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not God the Father or God the Son. Makes sense? Clear as mud, right? So, but again, that is the Trinity, and again, we do, you know, know that as, you know, Christians, hopefully we know that doctrine is seen throughout Scripture, you know, the word Trinity is not there, and a lot of people say, well, how can you teach about the Trinity or the rapture, or this or that, those words aren't in there, well, neither is Bible, so quit calling it a Bible, and the word Bible is not actually in there, when you look it up, so, but again, but the doctrine is, right? The teachings are there, and that's why we can end up utilizing them. So the Jehovah's Witnesses state that the Trinity doctrine was not conceived by Jesus or the early Christians. That comes from the book, Let God Be True. So they're taught that the Trinity doctrine is not original. Jesus never taught it. And that the early Christians did not actually claim a Trinity of the Lord. Well, I can argue against that by stating that Jesus made the comment that I and the Father are one. Right? He ends up, and then whenever he said that before Abraham was, I am. And whenever he even said, I am he, they all fell down backwards and whatnot in the garden. So, but again, Jesus did make many, or state many times that he was God. And how did I know that? Well, the Jews tried to kill him. They knew exactly what he was saying. So, again, the doctrine of the Trinity is there, even though they claim that it wasn't there. But, again, they're t telling the people, don't read the Bible, you're going to get confused, just listen to us. So, even in the New World Translation, you can see these truths in it. They're harder to find, but you can still see them. So, that is something to take in consideration. So the plain truth is that 
This is another of Satan's attempts to keep the God-fearing person from learning the truth of Jehovah and his son, Christ Jesus. So again, talking about the Trinity. So they're saying that again, it's Satan's concoction. Satan has created this idea of the Trinity to confuse people and keeping the truth of Jehovah away from people. And again, continuing on with the book, again, the obvious conclusion, therefore, is that Satan is the originator of the Trinity doctrine. So they're taught that, again, the Trinity doctrine actually comes from the devil himself, and that it is not true to who Jehovah actually is. Yes. Yeah, if you try to ask them what's your scriptural proof for it, they won't take you to the Bible. They'll take you to the Watchtower. They'll take you to the Reasonings of Scriptures. They'll take you to this book, Let God Be True. They'll take you to all these other publications to show you that the Trinity is not right. Because they're not going to take you to the Bible. Why? Because they don't know how to use the Bible. Well, again, as we saw, well, we saw just a while ago, right? They're discouraged from thinking on their own. They are told not to think independently. So therefore, you can't really fault them for it because, again, they are sucked into this cult and they are brainwashed into it. And again, it's not an overnight thing this is a gradual gradual thing that happens constantly and you're told this and bombarded with it constantly day in and day out for years but it would be subtle so a lot of times these things are so subtle you don't notice it and that's the problem that's how they're able to get people tricked into them uh, they don't just automatically go, okay, you're new, just don't stop thinking for yourself, stop worrying about everything, just listen to everything i got to say. They're not going to do that. They're not going to be that blunt about it. They're going to say, start reading these things, start doing this, and give you baby steps, and as you keep trusting and listening and whatnot, then they keep adding in a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more leaven, a little bit more leaven, a little bit more, more. Before you know it, you got a piece of bread about the size of I Love Lucy. You know, you remember that episode where she's trying to make the bread and all the yeast going all over the place, what not? But again, but what a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So again, it just takes a little bit at a time. It's not again; they're not going to sit there and just pour it all on you at once. It's just little by little, which is the reason why they're able to get away with it. So to them, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are not considered God. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not considered to be God. Again, they reject the Trinity. So the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ, they are not God based off of their teachings. All right. Well, we're going to start with the Holy Spirit in this and, kind of, and look and see what he says. There's a lot more to say about the Lord Jesus than there is about the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is considered to be an impersonal but powerful force used to accomplish the will of Jehovah. So the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force, it's, but it's also a powerful force that is used by Jehovah to accomplish His will. So if it's impersonal, they're taking away the personhood of the Holy Spirit. And again, it is being subjugated to nothing but a force, kind of like you know, the Jedi or the Sith, right? You know, Star Wars, you got the force. Everything is basically just this force that Jehovah ends up using to compel people to do various things and whatnot. These are the droids you're looking for. <laughs> so again, they're taking away the personhood of the Holy Spirit, and they even do this in their Bible, in the New World Translation. In fact, in that Bible, they change all the pronouns of the Holy Spirit to it instead of he. They neuter it, and also, again, make it where it is, again, no longer personal. Even though the Greek will end up saying, using the pronoun for he in the Greek. Apparently they don't know the Greek as well as they thought they do. But again, so they end up changing those. Again, without really hardly any basis for it. They, they change all that from he to it. But they also do not capitalize the word spirit when addressing the Holy Spirit. The word spirit is never capitalized in the New World Translation. It is always lowercase. But again, because they're not equating God's spirit with God himself. Again, it's just this force, this power thing that, they, that God ends up using 
to cause people to do various things or work through them. So the Holy Spirit, according to, again, using the uh, book Let God Be True, the Holy Spirit is not a person and is therefore not one of the gods of the Trinity. Again, this is coming from that let God be true. So again, saying that the Holy Spirit's not a person, and because the Holy Spirit's not a person, it cannot be one of the gods of the Trinity. That's what they say, gods, plural, of the Trinity. So they have this mistaken idea that there are three separate gods. Just like so many other religions that are out there, they think that the trinity you're worshiping three gods you're not it's one god three persons and one god but they're not the only ones uh, muslims think that it's three gods i mean just about every just about quite a few of them all think that as well but again they don't really have a full grasp of the trinity well how can three be one i don't know again i ask god mm. when you get there i have no idea how it works mm. But again, we are not worshiping three gods, right? We're worshiping one God. Again, Christianity is not polytheistic. We're not worshiping multiple gods. We only have one God. As Deuteronomy ends up saying, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. So again, we do have one God. And 1 John 5, 7, right? 1 John 5, 7, for... There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So again, that is the true nature of the Trinity. But again, they do not believe in the Trinity. Again, they the Holy Spirit is not God, is not equated with God, is just some kind of powerful force that, that, that God ends up using. <clears throat> Pardon me. So this brings us to Jesus. Brings us to Jesus and their thoughts about Jesus. So Jesus is considered by the Jehovah's Witnesses to be the first created spirit being of Jehovah. So the JWs, they end up, the Watchtower Society, they believe that Jesus is the first created spirit being that Jehovah made. So again, Jesus is not God. He's a created being. And what do they use to justify this? Well, one, they use very, very bad interpretations of Scripture. But Psalm 2-7 was that ends up uh, stating that, um, that Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Thou art my beloved son, this day have I begotten thee. They end up trying to use that, trying to say that Jesus was you know, begotten at some point in the past. A lot of, play, a lot of different religions and cults and stuff that claim to be a part of true Christianity. They use that to try to pu push that. But if you actually look in the New Testament, it'll tell you what that verse means. If you actually look in the book of Acts, I can't remember exactly where, but I'm thinking chapter 13, if I remember right. I know, Paul's I know Paul is speaking. It's one of his longer sermons and whatnot. But Paul ends up quoting that, and basically he's telling them that it's actually in reference to the resurrection. It's not about him being created or born or this or that. That uh, Psalm 2 7 is actually about the resurrection and him being raised from the dead. So let the Bible interpret itself. Quit putting your own ideas on it. If you use the Bible to interpret Scripture, you'll never go wrong. But, hey, I had the right chapter. So Acts, what, 13, what? Acts 13 33. This is where you find out where Paul uses that. So, let's see what they have to say about Jesus. Jesus the Christ, a created individual, is the second greatest personage of the universe. Jehovah God and Jesus together constitute the superior authorities. And so, Jesus was created. He is the first created thing that Jehovah made according to them. And he is only number two next to Jehovah himself. So, Jehovah and uh, Jesus are the two main authorities that they are to listen to. And that comes from a publication called Make Sure of All Things that they have. Notice how many publications we've already gone through and looked at on this. It's a whirlwind, ain't it? <laughs> so the truth of the matter is that the Word is Christ Jesus, who did have a beginning. 
So again, that's from let God be true. Again, the truth of the matter is that the word is Christ Jesus who did have a beginning. And this is actually commentating on 1 John chapter, or not 1 John, but John, the gospel of John chapter 1, verse 1. And they actually changed that a little bit. And we'll talk about that in just a moment in their Bible. But they do, but again, they're try, basically saying that Jesus did have a beginning at that point. And then they also end up using Proverbs 8.22 in their Bible, which ends up stating this, Jehovah himself produced me as the beginning of his way, the earliest of his achievements of long ago. So that's how they end up translating that verse. And they say that this is talking about Jesus Christ and again how that Jehovah made him. But what is the actual reading of what it says. Yeah, that's what the New World Translation says. Well, we'll let's see what the King James says. The actual reading is The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. A little bit different there. So, again, the difference between possessed and produced. And, again, yeah, so, you yeah, know, they end up changing that and changing some of the words and again to fit their ideas and their theology. So through Jesus Christ, Jehovah made all things. According to Jehovah's Witnesses, Jehovah used Jesus to create all things. So from the watchtower, so this, Revelation 3.14, is true because his firstborn son was the first of God's creations. Then with him as his active agent, God went on to create everything else that has been brought into existence. He was the beginning of the creation of God, not that he was the author of creation, but that he was the first one whom God made and whom God made without the cooperation of anyone else. So, again, they're basically taking this idea that, you know, where Jesus is actually, you know, being shown that, yes, he is the creator of all things, but they're twisting it to make it sound like God, that he was the first thing that was created by God. And, again, God can't create himself. God can't create himself. So, many times, Jehovah's Witnesses will end up stating that while Jesus is not Jehovah... He was elevated to the status of a lower God after his resurrection. And I even have a book at the house called, Who is That, Who is that God with Jehovah? And which is one of the books I ended up using for, you know, as a reference for this series here. But again, they end up basically elevating Jesus up to the status of a lower God. Where he is still a God, but he's not Jehovah. In that book, again, Let God Be True, he was a God, but not the Almighty God, who is Jehovah. Then Russell ends up telling them that. Again, Jesus was a God, but he's not Almighty God. He is not Jehovah, but he is a God, lowercase g. In fact, if you go to the New World Translation in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. The word was a God, not the word was God. So they end up adding that. Is there a difference between the word was God and the, and the word was a God? Yeah, big. that one little letter, that one little article changes the entire meaning of that. So again, they're viewing Jesus as a lower God from Jehovah. So again, another thing to, that they also teach, and again, Rutherford actually taught this, is that Jesus was actually the Archangel Michael before his life on earth, that he was the Ar Michael the Archangel. And before he ends up uh, getting his earthly life, and then after his death and resurrection, he he's not Michael any longer. But he also teaches that uh, Lucifer was Jesus' brother. And that Michael ends up doing the will, of, did the will of Jehovah, while Lucifer ended up sinning against Jehovah. So Lucifer was like the prodigal son and the evil son, and whatnot, while Michael was the good son that listened and whatnot. So they end up teaching those things there. 
And you can see that in The Kingdom is at Hand in, uh, by Rutherford. So, yeah, they do not equate Jesus with Jehovah. They have a lot of crazy ideas about Jesus. But we're not done yet because there's a lot to say about Jesus and their beliefs about him. So according to them, Jesus was only a man, definitely not Jehovah. So Jesus on the earth was simply a man. And again, he is not considered Jehovah by the witnesses. And as we were at the break, I was talking to somebody, and I was like, you know, if you can look at any religion, any cult, whatnot. If you ever want to know if they're right or not, just look at their stance on who Jesus is. If Jesus is not God and did not die for your sins and did not rise again the third day from the dead in a physical form, then you better turn the other way. <laughs> Simple as that. But again, that, so they're saying Jesus was only a man. Again, and that's actually a pretty common thing that you hear, even from atheists. So, well, he was just a good teacher. He was a man, he was what, yada, yada. But no, he was a lot more than that. I agree with uh, C.S. Lewis, right? Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. You have those three options. If he was a liar, then he was crazy and stupid because he died for it. If he was a lunatic, then nobody would have actually followed him. And they were fools for following after him. But if he is Lord, he is who he says he is, we need to listen to him. So again, they deny that Jesus was God incarnate on the earth. The Jehovah's Witnesses, do, again, deny the incarnation of Jesus, that he was God in the flesh on the planet. So they state that the justice of God would not permit that Jesus as a ransom be more than a perfect man. And certainly not the supreme God Almighty in the flesh. You know, it's still coming from Let God Be True, that book. So Jesus just had to be a man, did not have to actually be God. But the problem is, is that if Jesus wasn't God, then there's no way he could have paid for our sins. There's a reason why he was born of a virgin, because he didn't have the sin nature Sin nature comes from the man, because man has the seed. And so the men, we're the ones that pass sin on to all of our offspring. But that's why Mary had to be a virgin and Jesus be born that way. So he'd be a man, but that he would not have the sin nature in his flesh. So he'd be pure and holy and be able to die for our sins. So let's see what else they say here. So some insist that Jesus, when on earth, was both God and man in completeness. This theory is wrong. Well, there you go. Straight to the point, right? And that comes from Rutherford, the harp of God. If Jesus were God, then during Jesus' death, God was dead in the grave. Well, his body was... <laughs> His soul went to hell to purge out the sins. But again, what, three days later he came back. Thank you, Jesus. You know, if the resurrection wouldn't have happened, then the cross would have been absolutely nothing. If you don't believe me, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 a few times and get back to me. Because <laughs> it tells about the importance of the resurrection completely there. So the life of the Son of God was transferred from his glorious position with God his Father in heaven to the embryo of a human. Again, so again, he was simply, he was not again a spiritual being anymore. He strictly became a human being is what they're basically saying there. He's not 100% God, 100% man. He is just 100% man. So for these reasons, they refuse to celebrate Christmas. One of the key reasons why they refuse to celebrate Christmas, again, as we said before, a lot of all these holidays stuff they view as having a pagan origin, and therefore they do not want to celebrate those things, so they don't honor Christmas at all in those regards. So let's look at the death of Christ. Let's see what they have to say about the death of Christ. So... There's actually one of their artist renderings about the death of Christ. Anybody notice anything a little different? 
Yeah, he, he's not on a cross. So under the teachings of Rutherford, the, render, the renderings or drawings and stuff of Jesus' death began to show him die on a torture stake instead of a cross. So, he is died, so they actually start teaching that he died on a torture stake, that he was not on a cross. And again, torture stake just simply being like a pole and whatnot, as you see here. So let's see what the watchtower says. Again, so we know that Jesus was nailed to the torture stake. 1966, they know it. <laughs> Pardon me. As we're going to see tomorrow, they're going to kind of backpedal a little bit. But in 66, they knew it, that Jesus died on that torture stake. The cross is just a figment. It was actually just a pole, and his hands were up above his head. So again, according to their literature, as you see here, there's some more renderings from the Jehovah's Witnesses. The torture stake, again, as I said, a single standing pole with no cross beam. And again, just had one single nail that pierced both hands of Jesus that are above his head. And this is very important to take note of. Because when we talk about stuff tomorrow, we can actually use this to our advantage in witnessing to them. Because if you go by what the Bible says, even their translation of the Bible doesn't say that. Mm. Yeah, big mistake, right? <laughs> but, yeah. So, and by the way as i'll mention again tomorrow but one of the things that you may want to do just so that again you can actually be an effective witness for them and I, again i do not actually recommend reading this translation but let them use their own bible because a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about and the things we're going to show them they are actually in there why because all scripture is inspired by the word by the lord right whether it's corrupted or not is a different story, but all scripture is given by inspiration of God. There are still some grains of truth floating around in there. And so they will be more likely to trust that book than they are probably another one. They will trust the King James as well because it's still considered. They can still buy King James. But if they want to use their the New World Translation, then... Don't dissuade them because you can still show them the same truths even with that corrupted Bible that they got. So, but again, but it's all about building trust. And that's going to be the big thing. You've got to build a trust factor with them in order to be able to effectively witness to them. So, let's go to the resurrection now. So, we see the, you know, the death, right? It's really crazy, right? So, let's look at the resurrection. So according to the Jehovah's Witnesses, they claim that Jesus' resurrection was not physical, but it was a spiritual resurrection. I've heard that one a few times in various other cults and stuff and religions. So Jesus did not physically rise from the dead. It was a spiritual thing. Again, he did not have a physical body when he resurrected. That is what they are trying to make a claim of. That again, Jesus did not have a physical body. But he was simply a spirit being, and he rose from the dead like that. Well, again, that's where reading your Bible will just mess you up in the Jehovah's Witness stuff. Because if you go to uh, the accounts in the Gospels, I'm particularly thinking of John and whatnot. Right? They could touch him. They could handle him. He ate in front of Luke. He ate in front of him and whatnot and everything. He was physical. Okay? He was a physical person. He had a physical resurrection. But, again, they are claiming that it was not a physical resurrection, it was spiritual. And by, again, discouraging actually reading the Bible, they're not actually going to see that. Because why? You're going to trust the literature, trust what they say, and not actually trust what God's Word says. So, let's see what they say. Let's see what Russell says. So, he was put to death a man, but was raised from the dead a spirit being. The man, Jesus, is dead forever dead interesting that the tomb was empty where did the body go then grave robbers at least that's what the Pharisees said so, so the king Christ Jesus was put to death in the flesh and was resurrected an invisible spirit creature again that book let God be true so again Jesus was resurrected an invisible spirit creature 
So for these reasons right here, they also don't celebrate Easter. <laughs> Again, they don't celebrate Easter. Again, associating a lot of it with pagan origins and stuff as well, but... Again, their ideas about the resurrection are so skewed that they can't actually celebrate Resurrection Day the way that we do. And I really like the idea of Resurrection Day versus Easter. Just because, again, Easter is kind of, eh. So, let's look at the Lord's return. When the Lord's coming back. Well, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, and we saw this a little bit yesterday when we looked at the history, right? Russell ended up claiming that Jesus returned invisibly in 1874. So Jehovah's Witnesses still teach that, that Jesus returned to the earth invisibly in 1874. And again, Russell had to end up making that uh, accommodation. Why? Because Jesus didn't show up in 1874. So he came back invisibly and everything. Yeah. So let's see what they say here. So when Jesus said he would come again, he did not mean he would return in the flesh visible to men on earth. He has given up that earthly life as a ransom and therefore cannot take such life back again. And it comes from the good, this good news of the kingdom. That don't sound like good news to me. Of course, they're not taking consideration in John chapter 10 where Jesus said that I have the power to lay down my life and I have also the power to take it up again. You know, you know what they did to Jesus on the cross? Who killed Jesus? He did. If he would not have allowed himself to die, he'd still be hanging on that cross today. Why? Because he's God. He had to allow for himself to die. It didn't matter what they did to that flesh, his, his godly attributes would have kept him alive through it all. So why? He, he said, no, back, no man takes my life from me, I lay it down. Willing. And if I lay it down, I have the power to take it up again. This I have uh, from the will of the Father. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing somewhat, so forgive me. So again, so there would end up being a time of harvest. Again, so after this 1874 uh, there would end up being a time of harvest known as the times or the age of the Gentiles. They would end up lasting until 1914, as we end up seeing, or we saw yesterday or whatnot. And during that time period, Jesus was going to set up the kingdom. In 1914, he was supposed to set up his kingdom on earth. Uh, if this is it, then, you know, we've all been duped. So the good news today is that Christ Jesus has come again and that God's kingdom by him has been set up and is now ruling the heaven. All the evidence shows that Jesus took up his kingdom and power and began to reign from heaven in the year 1914. So since Jesus did not actually physically return to the earth, guess what? Another invisible thing. So Jesus did set up the kingdom of God, whatnot, but he is, it is on the earth, but he's ruling and reigning from heaven instead of ruling and reigning on the earth. You see how they start you know, twisting things to make it fit? Well, we weren't wrong. This is what actually happened and everything. So again, make themselves you know, look better than what they actually are. So the times of the Gentiles extend to 1914. And the heavenly kingdom will not have full sway till then. But as a stone, the kingdom of God is set up in the days of these kings. And by, cons and by consummating them, it becomes a universal kingdom. A great mountain and fills the whole earth. Watchtower repents. That's from actually one of the first volumes of the Watchtower way back in 1880. So again, so again he's making those claims that, again... The age of the Gentiles, times of the Gentiles, 1914, that Jesus is going to come back. Taking a little bit of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2, wherever the stone's going to come out of heaven, crush the statue, right, and become a huge mountain. Talking about the millennial reign and everything there. So the full establishment of the kingdom of God in the earth at AD 1914, the terminus of the times of the Gentiles. So again, they do believe that, again, 1914... Jesus, again, set up his kingdom, but he's ruling from heaven. So that he is actually ruling from heaven at this point. So in 
So they also stated that Armageddon would end up beginning at that point, although they've had to backtrack and change the date for Armageddon many, many times, and they still are changing it even today. And Armageddon has not yet been fulfilled. But again, so they end up, you know, changing that quite a bit. So, all right, so we finally got through all the stuff they think about Jesus. That's a lot. Yeah. I got a giant eraser in my classroom for big mistakes and stuff like that. Right there. So salvation. Let's look and see what they think about salvation. So how is one saved through the Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, salvation for a Jehovah's Witness is through works. You have to earn your way there. There is no free gift of salvation. There is only doing works. God does not give you salvation. You have to earn it. Really. You know, one key thing you can always note about false religions and cults is that it's always works-based. Guess what? Jesus did all the work for us. We don't have to do anything. The only thing we got to do is accept the work that he has already accomplished and live in it and trust him. He has the cure. We just got to take the cure. So again, joining the Jehovah's Witnesses and door knocking are both steps into, again, uh, earning that salvation and being granted salvation. If a person fails to follow all of God's commandments, then they will also lose salvation. So they also believe that you not only have to earn that salvation and you can attain it at one point, but then you can also lose it. Here's my question. If you did nothing to earn it, how could you ever lose it? It would be very cruel for the Lord to sit there and put this gift right here in front of you. Give it to you, knowing that you couldn't earn it. And then all of a sudden, all right, now you got to be perfect or I'm going to take it away from you. Knowing we can't be perfect. That would be a cruel God. Not one I'd want to serve. Again, the Lord takes care of all of it we rest in the lord and what he has done it is not through the works part of it so let's see what the Jehovah's witnesses say about their salvation so they must be recovered from blindness as well as from death that they each for himself may have a full chance to prove by obedience or disobedience their worthiness of eternal life that comes from russell again his studies of the scriptures so you have to prove that you're worthy to gain eternal life. I hate to tell you, nobody's worthy. The only one who was worthy was the Lord Jesus, and guess what they did to him? All who by reason of faith in Jehovah God and in Christ Jesus dedicate themselves to do God's will and then faithfully carry out their dedication will be rewarded with everlasting life. So again, you have to dedicate yourself to do all the things that God wants you to do and faithfully carry out that dedication. Do everything that God tells you to do and you will get eternal life. How many, of here, how many people in here have followed God perfectly since day one of your salvation? No, nobody? No one? I, I'm, not, I'm just asking for a show of hands. I'm not saying that I did, all right? Because <laughs> <laughs> anybody who claims that, boy, they are lying through their teeth. So what? Salvation is through the organization. Salvation comes from the Watchtower Society. By doing the works that they tell you to do, by doing everything they tell you to do, that's how you get saved in the Watchtower. So that's the only way you can be saved. And it is a Jehovah's Witness. It's through that organization, by doing exactly what they tell you to do. But what about hell? What about the doctrine of hell? A lot of people will say, well, hell is not actually the word and everything and whatnot. Hell actually came from the Vikings because of Hela, who was a goddess of the underworld and whatnot. And they are correct. That's what the you know, Germanic term ended up being, and uh, Scandinavian term ended up being. But it ends up you know, being brought into English, and therefore we translate the word for, that was Greek for hell, which was Hades, into you know, the term hell. If you end up saying Hades, you're taking away a lot of the connotations of how severe it actually is. But hell's not actually eternal, by the way. 
Revelation chapter 20 says that hell is going to be either thrown into the lake of fire. If you start telling, if you start witnessing people and start telling them instead of that they're going to go to hell for eternity, and say, "Oh, you're going to go to a lake of fire," it'll get their attention because why? They've been they've been hearing the word hell a lot. Just a little, little side note there. So what, what about hell? So they do not believe in hell or an everlasting punishment. The Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that hell exists. They do not believe in any type of ever, everlasting punishment. They believe in this idea of annihilation of the lost. This is an annihilation doctrine. Basically that anybody who is not saved will end up ceasing to exist at their death. So your soul just kind of dissipates and disappears and goes away. And there is no eternal punishment for somebody who is lost. That is what they end up preaching. And they're not the only ones. That is actually a, a fairly common idea in a lot of different religions and different cults and stuff. that are pseudo-Christian things. So again, annihilation doctrine. I actually had to study it a little bit whenever I was at college for my Bible degree. So, anywho. So, Joe's Witnesses state in their big faithful book there on the studies of scriptures... They have the doctrine of a burning hell where the wicked are tortured eternally after death cannot be true mainly for four reasons. One, it is wholly unscriptural. Okay. Two, it is unreasonable. Three, it is contrary to God's love. And four, it is repugnant to justice. That is what Russell had to say about it. Remember, when we looked at the history yesterday, right? Russell did not like the idea of an everlasting punishment in hell. He started really doubting that. So what? He started preaching against it and started saying that there's no evidence for it. What about these four things here? So he's saying it's wholly unscriptural. Um, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. There's a lot of different uh, scripture references to an eternal punishment, Old Testament and New Testament. Again, you got Matthew chapter 25, if I remember right, dealing with the goats and the sheep par uh, parable that ends up uh, basically Jesus, again, telling all the goats to go to the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. You also got Revelation chapter 20 that ends up talking about, again, hell and death being cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. We also have some references to a lot of this in the latter part of Isaiah. It's somewhere in the 60s. I can't remember exactly which chapter it is off the top of my head, but it's like 64. I'm thinking Isaiah 64. There's something about that in there as well. But again, those are just a few quick references for it. But again, Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. Is it where the worm dieth not, and there is wailing and gnashing of teeth? And, but he was actually talking about the lake of fire more than he was actually hell. Hell's just a holding place. It's a temporary thing. Again, lake of fire is eternal. So he says that it's wholly unscriptural. Well, we know that's wrong. It's unreasonable, really. How's it unreasonable? You've broken laws. You've committed crimes against, the, against God. Therefore, you need to be punished for it. It's not unreasonable. There, but God is love. God loves everybody. He wouldn't do that. God does love everybody. God is love. But guess what? God is also holy, righteous, and just. You cannot take the certain parts of God that you like and discount the parts you don't like. Otherwise, you're making your own God. A false God. So is it unreasonable? No. Why? Because there are standards. And if we violate those standards, then there's a consequence. It is contrary to God's love. Again, 2, 3, and 4 all kind of go together. Contrary to God's love. Well, not really because God provided a way out. Yeah, if God would have sat there and just let, oh, well, they sinned, oh, well, and just let everybody, you know, die and go to hell without actually having a way, then... Yeah, it would not be very loving. But God had a plan at the very beginning. He knew exactly what was going to happen. 
and he knew what, he, what would need to be, take place. And therefore, since God provides us a way out, provides salvation for us, then this is, that's God's ultimate source of love. God's not going to force us to love him. But those of us who, active, who produce active faith in him and, again, want to be with him, God, again, is going to give us that way out. Again, provide that salvation for us through the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So again, it is repugnant of justice. Uh, how is it repugnant of justice? You commit a crime, you go to jail, right? Well, at least that's the way it's supposed to work, right? You commit a crime, you get punished for said crime. doesn't matter if it's one law or all of them. If you commit a sin, you've sinned. Again, James says if you break one part of the law, you've the whole, broken the whole thing. So, and I always like to look at it like a chain on a chandelier, like one of these chandeliers right here. You take one link, cut that one link off, what's going to happen? Yep, it's just like the law. If you break one part of the law, you've broken the whole thing. The whole chandelier comes tumbling down. So thankfully we don't have to worry about keeping the law. Why? Because Jesus has already done so and paid for that for us. Amen for that. I'm glad he did, because I sure can't. <laughs> so, the Jehovah's Witnesses also believe that not only humans have souls, but animals have souls as well. I don't know why animals have souls. The Bible doesn't say that, but they do have spirits. There is a spirit of the beast that is talked about in Ecclesiastes, I believe. But they do not have a soul. Only humans have souls. But they state that all these souls will cease to exist at death. Again, they believe in that annihilation idea that if you're, again, you're not saved... And all these souls will just disappear, fade into existence, and act like they've never been there, and whatnot. So again, they do not believe in an eternal hell. And so if you try to, you know, say, well, if, if you don't, you know, do this, you're going to die and go to hell, the Jehovah's Witness would be like, well, that's no such thing. And I think Pastor Sean was telling me they had a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness that actually told him that. And I, I was like, and as soon as he told me that, I was like, yeah, I could have told you that was going to happen. Because you, if you don't know what they believe, then you don't know how to approach them. And again, that's why we have to go through their beliefs, right? Know where they're coming from. So we know how to approach them. All right, so what about heaven? We looked at hell. What about heaven? What about heaven? Well, for heaven, God and the faithful spirit creatures dwell in the invisible heavens. So God and the faithful spirit creatures, I love how they always use the term spirit creatures, but they're, they're the ones that live in the invisible heaven. They believe that only a limited number of humans are resurrected as spirit creatures. And of course, everybody pretty much knows the number 144,000 being equated with the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? And everything, because they end up taking that from the book of Revelation. But they don't actually read it, because if they read it, that's 144,000 Jewish people. Men who are virgins. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, a certain amount from each of the 12 tribes, minus the tribe of Dan. But anyway, so, again, don't read the book, trust us, right? That was the idea of the Jehovah's Witnesses and their society. Don't read God's Word, you just trust what we have to say about it. Again, if you read the Bible, you can actually see the truth in a lot of ways. So again, they believe that only 144,000 male and female Christians from the past 2,000 years will actually get to go to heaven and become these spirit creatures. And they believe that this constitutes the Israel of God, that 144,000 constitutes the true Israel of God. So they do not believe in the restitution of Israel, that Israel will be put back in the place of prominence and that they are still God's chosen people. They're basically stealing all of Israel's promises from the Lord. A lot of people like doing that too, by the way. I, I know one thing. Israel, yeah, you know, I love Israel. I want to, you know, be there for them or whatnot. But, you know, they can keep their promises. God promised them a lot of stuff. Because what? We, the church, actually have better promises. We're the bride. He's their king, which means we get to be the queen. And which means that they're, they're the subjects. And we get to rule side by side with Jesus. So why would we want a demotion? Why would we want to be demoted? Yeah. 
So again, they do not believe that Jews are still God's chosen people today, as I said a while ago. And again, they do believe that this 144,000 will be priests and kings with Jesus in heaven. Now, all right, so they've hit the 144,000 mark. They hit that around the 1930s. Everybody's like, well, what do they think about the rest of them? Where are the rest of them going to go? And everything. How could anybody still follow that if only that many people get to heaven? Well, they're not promised heaven. Simple. They're not promised to go to heaven. What the other witnesses, after that 144,000 have been done, all the other witnesses, they're promised only an earthly paradise. They will remain on the earth and they'll inherit the earth. So if you try to tell Jehovah's Witnesses that they need to get saved so that they can go to heaven, you're going to get about the same reaction as you need to get saved or you're going to go to hell. They're going to look at you, well, uh, I can't go to heaven. Because there's only 144,000 people that could go to heaven. The only thing I can ex uh, expect is an earthly paradise at the end of time and live on this earth. So you can't even pro give them the promise of heaven when you're witnessing to them at the beginning. And you can't threaten them with hell. Well, how the heck do we get them saved? <coughs> Patience goes a long way. But again, also, again, striking where we know that we can build that trust and break through that brainwashing that they've had for these years. And again, we're going to go over that in detail tomorrow. So again, gaining that earthly paradise is as good as it's going to get for a Jehovah's Witness. They have no hope for heaven. They have no hope for heaven whatsoever. An earthly paradise, that's as good as it gets. So the last thing we're going to look at is blood. I know we're getting ready to run over just a little bit, and I do apologize, but we're just about done. So blood. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses think about blood? Well, this actually comes from uh, Nor, as we saw yesterday. So they believe that in following God's commands uh, in the Old Testament about not eating blood, they're actually following that, and they tend to take blood transfusions as being a part of that commandment. So if you take a blood transfusion, they equate that as with eating blood. So that's why they don't do blood transfusions. Now, there's a difference between ingesting blood and then having, you know, blood put into your veins or whatnot and everything, getting a transfusion. Hopefully, the blood that you're getting transfused is good, unlike in the 80s when it wasn't, which is why the AIDS or, you know, disease spread all over the place. But, again, but now they do have a lot of screenings and stuff, and they do make sure that there is good blood. If there is found to be tainted blood, then they're going to find, all right, who screwed up? <laughs> And lawsuits galore. So again, hospitals are a lot better about this now than what they used to be way back in the day about things. But again, but why does the Old Testament tell us not to eat blood? Because there's a lot of diseases and things and stuff in blood, right? Blood carries a lot of bad things in it. That's why if we, you know, kill an animal, right, we're supposed to get all the blood out of it and make sure it's cooked through. That way that we can consume it safely. That's why I eat a well-done steak. I don't care what they say. I do not care what they say. If you do it right, it's always good. Everybody's like, well, it's always going to be burnt. Well, you didn't cook it right. <laughs> huh? <laughs> hey, and the same Bible says don't eat blood and whatnot. Red meat to me still has blood in it. So that's where I'm going with it. All right. So this is entirely different than ingesting blood, right? Blood transfusions, not the same thing as eating the blood of animals, right? And ingesting that, as we've said. And truthfully, you know, being willing to help somebody and even save their life through you know, blood transfusion, again, that's kind of at the core of Christianity, you know, being there for one another, showing compassion to each other, and to help each other out as well. I'm not saying go donate blood, but, you know, if you want to, by all means, go and do it and whatnot. You never know when you might need a tr blood transfusion one of these days as well. So that right there is pretty much the beliefs of the Jehovah's Witnesses in a nutshell. There are quite a few other things, but these are the main key things that we need to know and to effectively witness to them and be able to show them God's truth. So to, 
Tonight, so yesterday, again, we looked at the history a little bit. Tonight, we looked at their beliefs. Tomorrow, we're going to, tomorrow, we're finally going to be able to get to what we all came here for is to how to effectively witness to them. And as I said, the reason why we don't jump into it right away is because if we don't know anything about who we're trying to deal with, then we're not going to be very prepared to witness to them. So tomorrow we will go through the strategies, some techniques and stuff, and how to actually witness to Jehovah's Witnesses, and how to minister to them, and hopefully be able to win them to the Lord. So with that, I thank everybody for tonight, and God bless, and we are out of here. <laughs>